Thanks. Good evening, everyone, and welcome. Really delighted you are here. It's a special evening here in the College of the School of Public Architecture. Uh, and we're really pleased to have all of you be a part of it. Uh, the School of Public Architecture is now eight years old. Um, it's new, it's brand new. Um, and we are finding our way as we, as we grow and learning new things, engaging with new audiences. And this is one of those times when we are able to engage with the professional organization in, in a very meaningful way. And we're deeply appreciative of AIA New Jersey's support to make this all happen. Um, but there are a few people I want to thank. Uh, I wouldn't be here if it weren't for Rose Ganella, Associate Dean. Would you please stand up and please be recognized? Um, it was her idea to bring a new school of architecture to New Jersey. Um, and I'm so glad she did. Um, because with that, we've been able to find a place, I hope, to, to really work on some things that I care deeply about which is how architecture engages with the wider public world. And so from the very beginning, we called ourselves the School of Public Architecture. We really value that and want to achieve that. It's a long-term goal. It will take us a while to get to where we want, but I think it's a worthy goal to speak to. Um, and that's why it's so appropriate that this initial lecture involves Susie Rodriguez um, and her work in that public commitment. So we're really pleased for, for that all of that. Um, when this school started, again, I had the good sense to hire Craig Connick as the first faculty member, and we are so much the better for that. How about a round of applause for Craig? And, and when, when is Craig Fest coming? When's it coming up? Next week? Next week? No, it's coming up again this time. So anyway, we're so, we're so fortunate to have, have Craig here. The great thing about a new school is that everybody's pulling for it. We have wonderful faculty, many of, them, many of them are here tonight, and everyone wants to build something special. So we're working towards that end. And this is one of those moments, one of those measures, when we've reached a point where the real engagement with the professionals is meaningful. We have graduates who can go out and become components of the professional world in New Jersey. We're really pleased about that. Um, but we have high aspirations to connect to that world, to bring good design to it. Those are the goals that we set for the college. And so this lecture is a very special lecture for us tonight, and we hope it's emblematic of those goals and where we hope to go. Um, to represent A in New Jersey, I'd like to have past president Michael Hanrahan say a few words. Good evening, everybody. I'm Michael Hanrahan. I'm a past president of AI in New Jersey. I didn't know I was going to be giving remarks, so I guarantee you they'll be brief. Um, with that being said, the dean is absolutely right. Everybody is pulling for the School of Public Architecture, uh, and especially AI New Jersey. Um, so we're very pleased tonight to sponsor this inaugural lecture. We look forward to continuing this relationship in the future. And more importantly, we look forward to welcoming all of the students into the profession as you graduate. We look forward to being your colleagues and uh, just want to say thank you for the opportunity. Thanks, Michael. Great. And with that, I ask the, the head of the architecture program, Craig Connick, to come forward and introduce tonight's speaker. Now I know why I know when it's the microphone. Yeah, I wanted to do something. This is a professional event. So I wanted to ask our past and present members of AIAS and NOMAS to our student chapters to stand and be acknowledged. Okay. They have such excellent leadership and they don't get, you know, they do all this work and never get acknowledged. Thanks for being acknowledged. So thank you all. Okay. So this is an absolute pleasure. I've known Susie, I think, from the architectural leap when we started the student program, which is apt that we're doing a lecture with students and professionals. Um, 
So her firm designs at the intersection of architecture and the public realm to create buildings and spaces that distill the essence of cultures and communities. Her award-winning work is recognized internationally for its contribution to the vitality of cities and landscapes and the civic, cultural, and educational institutions that they serve. She is a recipient of the Women in Architecture Design Leader Award from Architectural Record, recognizing more than 30 years of design leadership as a founding partner and Enead Architects, formerly Polshek Partnerships. And in, in 2017, Susie began an independent practice. Some of her notable projects include Central Park's New Harlem Mirror Center, the Lycée Francais de New York, the Frank Sinatra School of the Arts, the Center for Feminist Art at the Brooklyn Museum, and the Davis Center for Human Ecology at College of the Atlantic. She received her undergraduate architectural degree from Cornell and her graduate degree from Columbia University. She lectures frequently on her work and has taught at numerous design studios at schools. She actively promotes the importance of design in the public realm as a board member of the Architectural League of New York and as a founding member of the Arts for Projects for Human Rights. Please welcome Susan Rodriguez. Hi. Anyway, thank you so much for having me. It's really a pleasure to be here in this super cool space. This country is amazing. Um, anyway, I'll hopefully won't talk too, too long because there's an amazing uh, amount of food. I know people are eyeing in the background. So anyway, but I, I have a lot to share and I'm looking forward to doing that. Um, okay. Um, so the work I'm going to show you tonight is in, I'm going to read a little bit in the beginning and not so much after, but the work I'll share tonight is inspired by a deep understanding of place and purpose that gives meaning to the conceptual underpinnings for each project I will show you. This attitude about design informs the development and relevance of what is being designed, providing a framework for which to understand the potential impact that a project can have to make stronger connections to place and heighten an awareness of where we are in the world and our responsibilities as caretakers of it while reinforcing communities. But simply put, it's about getting to know a place and a community and caring about it. its culture and history as the context for developing a deep understanding about the program and purpose for a building in order to translate that understanding into tangible and resonant identities that frame a meaningful and memorable experience and one that uplifts, uplifts daily life. And I think that's really an important thing to remember. What we do is for a reason. It's not for ourselves. It's something that we share and it is incredibly public. So as Craig said, in 2017, I took a leap and it began an independent studio. I was in a partnership for more than 30 years um, with a lot of guys. And um, we did work in the public realm um, and it was a large um, practice. And it was a really amazing foundation for me. Um, the founder of the studio um, was Jim Polshek who sadly passed away in um, the fall, but he was my mentor and he made everything possible for me. And, I think that um, you know at the time I've been doing this now for forty years, and I think when I started, with David and I were just talking about New York was a really different place. It was a place where pretty much there were very few women as mentors. And when I met Jim in grad school, he was the dean, so deans can be really helpful. Um, he asked me if I wanted to work with him, and so I said I was a little not sure about it because the firm was a little large. And finally, I said, I'll try it out. And I stayed there for 32 years. Um, 
any case, um, my new studio is kind of a dream come true for me. The space, some of you might have, have any of you here been? I, we had a group, about one, two, yeah, five. Um, but it's a wonderful old loft space. It's fantastic, but it's um, got wonderful light. And But it's a much more intimate setting. And it was something that I really wanted to do was to create a place where we could work collabor collaboratively and um, really think about, think long and hard about what we were doing and the work we were creating. So our work is really now focusing on exploring, continuing the, the journey, as I said, the unique circumstances of place and purpose as sustainable propositions. And that's really important from day one. Every project has to be thought about as to what its impact is going to be um, in, on the world. Um, and so, the place where we create, you know, is um, in New York City. Um, it's, I, you know what, I forgot to ask about a pointer. Is this going to work? No. Oh, I can do it this way, right? Mm -hmm. I'll explain in words. <laughs> that which is, is that going to work? <laughs> oh, okay, great. Thank you. And I'll stand this way. I love that. Okay. Um, so our place in the world um, is New York City. And our studio, as you can see with that red arrow, is embedded in um, urban fabric in the far west side of Chelsea. And it used to be a really bustling environment, you know, very industrial. And um, it's really evolved into a, gift, a district of galleries. And um, you can see the ongoing emergence of these super talls. And they are really... Um, aggressive. Um, and so what's really interesting to think about um, this development, which is happening just five blocks north of us, um, where we sit in this small um, 19th century warehouse building. And it's really a welcome reprieve to all that development to the north. And, you know, I feel like we're perfectly situated when I was looking for our space, we're right um, half a block from the High Line and a block from the Hudson River. And I think it's a constant reminder to me of the importance of the natural world in the built environment. And the High Line is just a magnificent place. It's evolved over, I think it's almost 10 years now, two friends at a community board meeting realized it needed to be safe. So, you know, two people together can build energy and enthusiasm for creating a really important, what's now one of New York's most important. And then I like to ride city bike to work. So this is my daily route. So I'm always reminded, it makes me happy in the morning. So um, any case, um, this is uh, sort of being sandwiched in between two landscapes. And I think you'll see that's a theme throughout what I'm going to be talking about. And I think this is um, at 111th Street on the Upper West Side, but the kind of uh, counterpoint of the built, obviously quite severe here and the natural world and how we think about these two things um, and what, what they mean. Um, so the first thing I want to speak about is really where I came from before I started my studio. It's um, a collective memory. Um, I call it. I think I learned about that in grad school. Um, and Aldo Rossi, he might not be somebody you're all familiar with, but the work we're doing now builds upon the work I've done for the last 40 years. And so many places and cultures and uh, I've explored in New York City and beyond. It's something I carry with me, sort of like the bags are getting heavy, but it defines my collective memory. And I have... Um, a number of young people that work in the studio. We're very small, we're seven. But um, I realized that's part of what my job is to build their collective memory. You know, we um, sometimes realize we don't share enough. So I'm telling them, go look at this, go look at that. And, you know, it really, even if it's music or movies, um, but it's all about an experience and how you experience life. And you all have a lot to share with us and vice versa. So I think that generational dialogue is really important in a studio. So when you're looking for a job, you should look for, for that. I think it's really critical. 
So what I'd like to begin um, my talk with um, is highlights of the journey I've taken, and then that would translate, and you'll see a lot of themes uh, from that work that will lend, lend themselves toward understanding what we're doing now. So I broke it in sort of groups. Um, the first is about New York City, and my husband Charlie's here, um, and when we, um, our son was born, he was traveling all the time. And I needed to be home. So I became a tease called the Borough Girl because I had a project in every borough for quite a while. And so the New York City grid and all that New York is about um, became really important and more important as you design and build in these places. And you realize how varied they are and how different. So the first project is the Lycée Francais. It's um, uh, a project, and these will be little short short stories, and then a little bit longer as we get into the new work. But this was a project where six um, buildings were brought together um, in one new building to create a new identity for the Lycée and a French cultural center. And the idea surrounding it was how to create that French cultural center, a core around a landscape. And I would say that so many of the, the themes that uh, this New York, um, grouping is, is about thinking about urban life, everyday life, and how to make it more extraordinary. You know, it can be a bit of a grind. So how do you make going to school wonderful? Um, and it's sort of an optimism about sharing what these institutions are and how they connect with the city and making them more welcoming and accessible and bringing nature to city life with green roofs and green walls. And there's, you'll see a mix of public and private agencies enlivening the street. And I realized one, one common thread is many of these were built on parking lots. So, you know, very mundane and how you take the city and make it a better place. So you can see that red core, which then is again, the landscape. And then here in the section, you realize that that landscape, cafe and auditorium are all the center and share. And the entire school comes together about those spaces, simple idea. Uh, two uh, towers on either side, um, or low towers, and how they introduced a basic, a secret garden and a whole public cultural center. And the other thing I think that's important, and you'll see that I in really compositionally enjoy, is modularity and how to express scale in um, a building. So the, how do you find your your room? Your uh, and so each of those is the size of a twenty five foot. Um, townhouse bay, because they originally were townhouses. And so that ends up creating a scale and order to a whole prefabricated system um, of recycled channel glass material. And then um, just about finished about six years ago was this uh, addition. So using that same material, you can see it um, kind of wrap around the corner. Anyway, you can see it wrapping around the corner in the upper. Um, Right hand corner, but this new addition gave an added space to the Lycee and it became a beacon on the avenue um, in the evenings. And here you can see a space for the little children. And also, one of the things that the school is very concerned about is security. So, the idea of having daylight, but a diffused glass enables that sense of security. So, um, this is a diagram. Reorganize myself here so I can try to point better. At least I can see over the uh, lectern. That's not always the case. <laughs> um, okay, this is better. Okay, so um, here's the lease setting, and this is so coincidental. So the next project you're going to show is the Sinatra High School for the Arts. Can you believe it? That's where it's located in Astoria. So if this is Manhattan on access. And the weirder part is this is where we live. <laughs> so who knows why that's like that, but maybe I've never done a project in New Jersey. So maybe if we just go across this river, <laughs> we can do one over there. So I'm gonna put a big line and we'll figure out what's possible. Um, any case. So uh, this was a project that was really quite exciting. And um, it was working with Tony Bennett to create a public high school in his hometown, Astoria. 
And you know, you'd think it was kind of a embedded in the city, which it is. But as it turns out, that site is really important because here it is across from Astoria Studios, which is one of the big um, screening, you know, screening spaces in the city and has been for generations. And so all of these, um, maybe only some of us know who these people are, um, but Paul Newman, you should all know who he is, um, and Woody Allen, and et cetera. But this was where so much has happened, and this was the site across the way. It was a parking lot, and it was also um, the barracks for the military, where they filmed the dailies in the Second World War. So understanding these places and that they're just not um, in the middle of nowhere. They're special. They have their own history, and you want to draw that out. But one of the things is when you walk down the street here, you'd never know anything important that happened there. So this idea of revealing the arts to the public um, in the facade of the uh, building became a really important celebration of what the Sinatra High School was named after um, Tony's best friend. And with the puzzle of program and purpose, the idea of showcasing the arts and um, all in the front here, you can see sort of the literal alignment of art, music, and dance as in, in the facade. And then the big central auditorium and rising to the top, another green room. And it, here, this um, big uh, atrium cuts through with skylight at the top and then the, um, uh, the green roof and right off the green roof is the cafeteria, which is pretty unorthodox for New York City public schools. So not only looking at the building, but looking out from the building and creating a place that students are proud to be. And it's a place for the arts. Um, not too far, but in Brooklyn, um, another borough is a project uh, for Common Ground Community, which is a not-for-profit housing development corporation. And when you go and start these projects, they're partially funded um, by the state and the city. And they hand you this little eight and a half by 11 piece of paper and said, this is what your plan is. And so uh, not too inspired. So how do we give dignity to um, this living? It was for with Actors Fund of America and for formerly homeless and HIV AIDS patients. Um, and so what we realized why this was another parking lot and why it never had been built on was because three subway lines ran underneath it. So the challenge of doing that was tremendous. And working with a really talented um, structural engineer, Nat Oppenheimer, we realized what we needed to do was cantilever the building over the subway. Because if you, um, the, uh, the weight, the dead load was on it, it was fine, designed for that, but not the new lateral loads subsided. So the thing that that enabled us to do is, oh, so I should go back, is enable us to make a glass facade and one that was much lighter in weight. So the structure then was a lot less expensive. When I first came, they thought I was like a clueless and sort of lost my mind to propose something like this, but it ended up being a lot more affordable. And again, we integrated another green roof in the back. So this became a way to create a really dignified housing for formerly homeless individuals. And also to sort of rejigger the planning so that the um, across the hall, you actually had a cluster of four neighbors instead of looking at a blank wall when you opened your door. So all sort of small pieces. And the idea of the first, um, and anyway, the idea of the first is what we designed and the potential for it to become um, a module that could be uh, implementable on many scales. And all the um, system was prefabricated in step level. So it really was a very local thing. And then each was a 275 square foot apartment. Um, at the Brooklyn Museum, this is sort of a shared um, effort of some of my partners working on and developing this new public entry, but I seem to get to take on developing a lot of the pieces, about six of them on the interior. And so transforming and renewing the museum 
um, was a really exciting piece. And as it turns out, my son's going to get married here. It's so exciting. Anyway, um, <laughs> but this is a whole, this is what it looked like. Nice purple columns. And then how to transform it, capture the light, introduce new circulation to make it more accessible and engage this um, wonderful space. And not only really recreating this great hall, but also the floor above. And it's a historic um, glass block floor that we couldn't change the small module, but, we, but it, what we did is put larger pieces of thick pieces of tablets of glass to create a whole new layer and whole new floor on top of the historic floor. So it kept the light coming in and it's still really quite beautiful and obviously can be used for multiple things in addition to art. So yoga at the Book Museum is quite a popular thing. And then as um, Craig said, one project, a competition I won was for the creating a home for Judy Chicago's dinner party. And it's really um, amazing space. It's a place I think that women consider really important place to go and honors women, 39 guests at the dinner table. And Judy Chicago made this as a collective piece in honoring the important uh, importance of women and their voices um, in the world and in the arts. And so big triangular grand monumental space on the fourth floor of the museum right below the dome. Um, moving to the next borough is Staten Island. And this might also date me a little bit, but when we interviewed for this job, we kind of called it Working Girl Meets Homestead. And because you had to take the ferry um, to get there uh, from Manhattan. And uh, Frederick Law Homestead actually had a studio and nursery here in Staten Island. So learning a lot about Carrera and Hastings, who also did a number of buildings, there was a lot of interesting history. But what the project really was, not only creating civic space and identity, really understanding the rational organization of the program, each of these towers of justice or courtrooms stacked below them, but it was really about transforming an urban void. It was a four acre parking lot, see the theme continues, and um, which was a quarantine hospital in the, 18th, in the late 18th and 19th century, and then a Victorian poltergeist really where they built on top of what was burial grounds. So when we started the project, they did start to do excavation and found human remains. And they had all been um, moved where the park is at the northern end, and that had to be respected. And then the courthouse set it to the south of it. And so creating this new um, public landscape that was surrounded by the library, the theater, and uh, the new courthouse. Also another green roof where you can see just in its nascent days, but the importance again of extending the landscape into um, this context. And I think one of the most spectacular pieces is actually um, the view on each of the court's floors where you are on jury, jury duty. And you really, I think it dignifies that experience as well. All the courtrooms, I, which I've not shown today, but all the courtrooms have daylight in them and a really important piece. And then when I was teaching studio at Cornell, um, there's in the space downtown, I was, we had a morning meeting for some reason. And I looked across and that was, you could see the courthouse from downtown. This is a view from the ferry. And then I love the diagram on the right because that shows the uh, Staten Island Ferry and its scale relative to the courthouse. And so I think trying to understand the impact of the public space and where you're intervening and how big things are is really, really important. So those ferries sitting on at the waterfront are of the same magnitude as this new public building and similarly public space. So this is in effect being like being on the deck of the ferry. Um, so the last borough is the Bronx. And uh, I had the pleasure of working um, there at New York Botanical Garden for more than 20 years and many projects. I'm just going to show you two. But um, this is an amazing 200 plus acres in the Bronx, which is attached to the zoo. Um, and 
one of the projects is in the garden and the other in the historic precinct, scientific precinct, and the other is just outside. So the first is a research laboratory. Um, and this research laboratory at the northern end of the garden and by Twin Lakes is really, a, I think it's a tree house for scientists. They're doing serious uh, botanical research, um, molecular DNA analysis of all plant material. And with that, to create a place that one of the scientists called it reciprocal illumination. And I thought it was a really great term because it's as you're working in this very molecular way, you just raise your head and look out the window and you sort of understand the context in which you are working. So this created a much more open environment for the scientists to work and a place where they really can see the passage of the seasons the section up on the upper right hand corner so it's a building that's sort of perched um, right on that ridge looking over twin lakes into the tree canopy and but what i think is important is this scientific research is done in the context of this very serious historic realm it's one of the oldest botanical gardens in the united states um, it's modeled after kew in london and so really trying to understand how this becomes sort of simpler contemporary interpretation of the historic buildings, materially, et cetera, creating a portal to the natural world. At that point, this wonderful double height space as you move into the building. And then um, also just outside the garden, this was an opportunity to take a garage and, or take a parking lot and turn it into a garage. So 800 cars, right, pretty large, right along the train, train tracks. And, um, and so how to do that in uh, some way that would embody what the garden is all about. So it's how do you bring the garden into the city? And so that became the idea and to create a really monumental um, vertical garden. Some of you might know what a chia pet is. I think of it sort of like that. Whoops. And here you can see um, this grand, um, same materials and quality of construction from inside the garden with the precast concrete and this green screen um, infill the trellis. And then um, a, real, a serious commitment from the garden to select um, specified plant materials that will thrive, four different ones for the four different orientations. And so here was just when it was getting going and now it's just really quite lush. Um, so I think it, it succeeded in really extending the garden in, into the city. And you can imagine from a sustainability perspective what it does, not only in the architecture we've created, but in the urban move that they've done. People come to the garden mostly on the weekends. So this becomes a place you can park your car and then take the train into the city. So I think for clients to think like that, I think it's very, really, really important. I didn't show a nighttime view. It also makes the neighborhood much safer because each of the four corners has a stair tower for egress and it, uh, they glow at night. So it's a really changed the neighborhood. So beyond New York, um, I always seem to have projects in places that are hard to get to. They're not far away, but they're, the flights are hard and you have to transfer. It's Pittsburgh or Indianapolis or whatever. So, um, but some of the, this, the first one I'll show you is outside an hour south of Pittsburgh, but other grids. And I think you bring your know-how from whatever your experience is to other cities, and you have to get to know things, know these places differently. You know, they're not your backyard. And so this idea of repurposing um, a building that was built in um, the 50s as a museum and a new identity for the arts on Maine and one of our first mandates is we don't look at courthouses mail anymore. So the lower photograph is what the museum looks like. And how could we make a bold move, create layers surrounding this existing building? They didn't have a lot of money and they needed us to expand their gallery space and create a new identity. So this cantilever became a really exciting proposal because it didn't block off the neighbors to, um, to the east. And it enabled this exciting, incredible um, 
cantilever to provide views of the surrounding area. And it's really beautiful. And their collections were very much about this landscape so that you actually can experience the views and see the paintings and work um, from, from this building. And I think I love the photograph on the far right because it shows as we were building this um, truss that actually the framing and steel framing, et cetera, mimicked the forms of the uh, small residential houses um, right to the, to the uh, side. Another project of repurposing, renewing is um, in Boston. I actually went there the other day just to see it's about probably six years old. I, as I said, seven of these projects I finished my last year. Um, so it's a lot. <laughs> But I, and it's amazing how they've just really taken it and used it in fabulous ways. There are big murals everywhere, lots of art. But this is for Mass Art. It's a center for design and media. But it was an old gym. And the old gym was at the middle, it didn't have air conditioning or heating. And it was a really kind of like a hard rock in the middle of a million square feet of art, art and design. So, um, what should we do here? So basically it's breaking open the block, breaking open the box to create this new center to repurpose, reinvent the space and to create a portal for their whole campus. Um, it took 10 years. It was with, um, it's a public, one of the largest public art schools in the country. And so it was publicly funded and really tough project. But after 10 years, it finally came about, which was really exciting. And in it, we cut skylights into it, and now they use it for changing exhibitions. And it becomes sort of like Grand Central Station or Penn Station, um, where it connects all the different buildings surrounding it, which is really successful. And that white wall there to the right is now a huge mur mural. So beyond the grid, um, there's just a couple more. These are three landscape projects that I did. Um, and I think they're about campus. They're about building in fragile places and how to experience the landscape. And this was a project um, that began right around 9-11. And we, it was the first um, fine arts building that was uh, sustainably designed with geothermal wells and uh, natural materials. But it really was about creating this flexible framework for the arts. And, um, but it was 60,000 square feet, not huge, but this campus, it was huge. So one of the things I realized, I, I, we almost didn't go after the project because I said, this just doesn't fit here. But then I started to think about, well, if we could submerge half of the program below grade, a lot of it was, didn't want natural light. So what we did is we cut the half of the program in, created this terraced roofscape facing south, and then maximized all the daylight throughout the rest of the building, and then created this very purposeful uh, step landscape with big garage doors that open out um, during you know all times of year, frankly, because it gets very warm. This is at Sarah Lawrence College in uh, Westchester, and it's been really successful as it engages the arts and brings it out into the public. And anybody can. There was a path on the site; you can just walk up and through the building to go to class. And then really taking seriously the daylight control, south, north, I'm just showing you here to the south, but the calibrating the Brissolet system so that it created a comfortable environment for drawing and painting. And then um, this last of the roof is not too far away from that project, but a really different campus, the Westchester Community College and they wanted to create a gateway for opportunity and education. Many of the um, immigrant community in White Plains area um, were Mexican, didn't speak English, and this became a place for them to actually, it's English as second language, and they were able to learn through studying something that had meaning to them, which would be business or fashion. And it was fantastic, but how do we make that place of welcome? And so this became an important the marker, which lights up at night, because they, many of them were taking a bus. The bus stop was right here, and they could walk into the building. Um, and then 
What I think is very important though, is this gateway about this monumental welcome. This is sort of like a 24 seven building. The campus isn't like that, but this building is. And how um, as part of this suburban campus, and not unlike your university is very different as a curricular, but the, um, it was an old estate. And this was given to the community college system. So it's a beautiful place um, and open. But how could you make this monumental space that became really an intersection of the community and the campus on this landscape? And it was a beautiful site. So how not to build an object in the site, but actually frame the landscape and draw the, uh, people both from the community and the campus to this place um, in, in this monumental space. The other trick was that again, state funded project with a little private money, but we had to figure out how to make this affordable. And as you notice, instead of big tall columns supporting this space, what we ended up creating was a modular system. I call them lobster pots and you'll see why soon, but they were something that anybody could fabricate. And so it became a beautiful stacking of these pots that could all be adjusted and it created this really wonderful daylight space at the heart of the two arms of the um, program. Um, so the Pequot Museum is really a full face. Darius, um, who I work with, is here today. Um, we, were we were talking about making renderings for this project. I think it started maybe 30 years ago, but it was a place to realize that what you make is about telling stories about other people. Not you. This isn't my story to tell, it's theirs. So how do you interpret their culture and give it meaning? And you can see their um, historic fort and cutting the building into the landscape, like the other two, minimizing the scale of 320,000 square feet um, into this sloping landscape and to create a monumental gathering space that is emblematic of their culture to the details of bringing the shells from the local um, the wampum belts was a very important part of their culture and embedding that into the terrazzo on the floor and the woven railings, et cetera. So it's a very, uh, a moment for the tribe to be able to tell their story through architecture. So um, as I transition here, um, I think one of the things I've become aware of, and maybe it's in the end why I wanted to create my own office and studio was because I've always had parallel life to uh, working in the public realm in cities, et cetera. And that was um, a small a rural community in Maine where we go um, when we can in the summers. It's a beautiful place called Vinyl Haven with amazing, important culture. Um, our friend Clarence reading at uh, Memorial Day every day, every person who ever served in the military is read um, at this but the importance of community, their history is an acquiring island where many of public buildings um, that granite came from here and lobstering is crucial. Things have to work there. It's not some fancy thing that architects design and then it breaks down, it's gotta work. And the modularity, the uh, predictability and the scale of the lobster, got to be the right size for the lobster trap. I mean, just all some really logical, important things. Everything, even the children's books, the literature is all about this place, the capturing the landscape, the lessons learned and how they become really important to that culture. And the art, so much inspiration is about going to Maine and enjoying this place. And this is uh, Louise Nelson and the great photographer, Pedro Guerrero, um, but uh, photographing her amazing work. And she worked in Rockland, which is um, Vinyl Haven is right off the coast where the ferry comes. But even getting around, it's a lot different than taking the subway. I mean, you really have to know how to navigate in the fog and uh, something I've learned uh, over many years, but there's different systems, everything is different. So again, I think this juxtaposition of these extremes became something that I always carried with me. And I think the desire to integrate landscape into things is important. So this little um, 
island off the coast of Maine that is off the grid. It's something that's been in the works for um, more than 30 years. And it's a coincidence of place. You can see the island. Uh, you can see the island beyond, but this is the quarrying of the Cathedral of St. John the Divine's columns for the high altar. You can see that in the upper right. And I happen to have been the architect for the cathedral, one of my clients for more than 20 years. And it happened that this place, these two places have shared the grin between them. And it's a beautiful, um, amazing vestige of this time that is there today. Um, and this is the island today, right uh, across the way. But the working waterfront, the modularity, the ability to bring um, all of the, and these are existing buildings that we built from, but everything had to come by high tide. It had to be very practical. It had to be um, something that could be done in a very short building season. So you can see this post and beam construction. And each of the pieces over time have been different versions of the same modular structure. And here you can see, you know, it's surrounded by sort of a rocky perimeter um, at a high point where the uh, cabin, main cabin is positioned. And, but also, how, what do you do for infrastructure, water, collecting of the water, um, and then how that water then is um, drawn? I'll show you in a minute. But then the industrial durability of everything and how you have to be able to close things up simply at the end of the year. Um, and here you can see the water collection system, the cans of the the, the six and 12 roofs, and how then they go into a series of cisterns that are underneath that then are pumped up to a water tower. So all of this um, is seems simple, but it's something that you need it to be simple, but it takes a while to, to figure, figure it all, all out. But here, positioning it toward the sun, the simple materials that weather with time, and then you can see the expression of that eight-foot module and the daylight and views into this space, but all made by two by four standard frame construction. Then sort of bringing together this institutional background and fiddlehead background gave me this opportunity to do a project for a friend who was founding a school in Zambia, rural Zambia off the grid, the Chipakata Children's Academy, um, where we realized how did they go to school? Because you couldn't really come in there and impose yourself. So the idea of looking at the existing schools and realizing they were fairly dark, they're modest, four classrooms per bar. What could we do to not um, reject this, but try to improve upon it? So pulling it apart, giving space between, as you can see in that plan diagram, and then pulling the roof up and trying to, at um, non-rainy season, create more room. Uh, figuring out where north is, that was really important because it's below the equator. We didn't get it right at first, um, so be careful about that. Um, that was right at the beginning, so it, we uh, figured it out. But that daylight studies were important. There's no electricity. Um, we also had to think about how this could be built so it could be built by the local community. Working with my friend Joe, who runs one of the best contracting businesses in New York City. So he brought that to Zambia. And so lock construction, steel is fabricated, fabricated in Lusaka, um, very uh, systematic. Nat Oppenheimer also was the structural engineer um, on this. So it was a collaboration of friends who were helping our friend who wanted to start this. And so I realized that we could work differently. I didn't need to work in a big office. I could figure out how to bring people together for particular projects. And this is um, just showing it uh, pretty complete. There's more that's happened since. But I think that collaboration was wonderful and trying again to interpret and bring some of the culture and the sense of community to this place is the opening day and the children on this platform that um, keeps it up high from the rainy season. But you can see the modularity, the openness, literally like the diagram. And then here to open up the roof, which provides four more classrooms per building, um, but only not in the rainy season. Uh, but I really love this and that 
other part is you can see the third image um, from the left, and that is um, they sneak up there because they've never been on stairs before. So this idea of being able to um, move up and be able to see their village in the distance is a really big treat. They get in trouble though when they do that. Um, so here are just some details and simple corrugated metal roof, simple repetitive structure, you know, light gauge framing for the trusses, um, and just that space in between. The texture of very modest, just slipping up the block structure to create that openness and a little. They didn't like doing this too much. It was hard. Um, and then the shelter uh, where they eat and gather. And then just a beautiful sunset in the evening. So in the current work, there are um, a number of projects. We've been, I feel so fortunate to have gotten some really great commissions in the, um, since 2017. And so I'll just share with you some of that work. The first one you can imagine, it's in Maine. It's a cabin and it's for girls. And it's uh, the Chwanki Foundation, it's the girls camp that's starting. These are the first five cabins. Um, and they really take a lot of um, clues from what we did at Fiddlehead and um, reinventing the cabin. They were dark, these are for the boys. This is 100 years of boys and finally girls are gonna be, are here. And so we analyzed really carefully, what were these cabins? Chicken coops, we found out. Dark because they didn't have windows. So in reinventing that on this place, 400 acre peninsula, uh, how, did, kind of, how to think about a girl's first interaction with the natural world. And also with climate change, uh, the weather has become increasingly unpredictable. So the idea of creating a community, a place that they could hang out that was daylit when it was pouring rain or when it was cold. So that's where we created this sort of finally, um, this C-shape um, strategy. But all along the road though, we had to know, okay, we have bunk beds, we've got all this stuff. And if the stuff didn't fit, the design wasn't gonna work. And so it became urban design by bunk bed, uh, community design by bunk bed, and how to figure figure out that scheme. And in the end, as I said, the C-shape alternative with bumps along the perimeter, 12, uh, 12 beds per cabin. They're really tight, you know, 16 by 32, but it maxes out. We made everything. And the cool part was there was a man who was on the building committee. He said, I was growing up. He was in his late 80s. He said, I always had my own little window to have my own view of the natural world. So every girl, whether top bunk or bottom bunk, has that view. So they became, it was important, their orientation to the sun. And here you can see some of the renderings. So the repetition of these south-facing primed, if they do want to do solar at some point to contribute back to the rest of the facility, while these don't have much electricity only for egress, which is required, um, that could be really great real estate for that. And here they are um, constructed. And you can see, again, the modular timber frame made with um, Shelter Institute, who's just down the road, who did our cabin, original cabin 30 years ago. So they're all gonna, you know, this is the first five and they have five more to happen soon. But it's really wonderful. It's very much kit of parts. And so you can see the materials, all natural material, locally harvested uh, uh, cedar from, from the area and the spruce. Uh, and the, one of the things that's really gratifying is that the ventilation really works. You know, these upper windows, they said you can really feel the convection of hot air that's drawn out at the top. So again, natural ventilation, light on the land. And here you can see on the back end. Because of getting to know Maine, this was a really lucky project. Um, a firm in Belfast, Opal, asked if I'd be interested in collaborating with them. I said, sure. And so we were 
did this RFP. I thought I'd never do an RFP again, but I did. And this is at College Atlantic. It's a small college, 400 students on the Atlantic. Can you imagine going to school on the ocean? Beautiful um, sort of, but harsh climates. It's also an idealistic place. It's the College of the Atlantic. Everybody studies human ecology. It's your relationship to the natural world, whether you're a poet, designer, scientist, et cetera. It would have been at school that I think Rachel Carson would have found it. Uh, but it was about bringing back the economy of Mount Desert Island when there was a big fire in the 1940s. And it took quite a number of years to get it going, but um, finally they, they did. And it's a campus that faces Acadia National Park as its backyard and the uh, ocean. Um, Frenchman Bay is the, um, is the uh, here that you're looking at to the north. The working waterfront again, another shared theme. And sustainability. This is where they walk the talk. It is sustainable life. They everything about their day is about food systems and composting, and they're very active in terms of. It's a wonderful place, and um, they have this college governance. It's sort of okay as an architect. You have to come every meeting as you have to present to this four hundred people. Anybody can ask you a question. If you want to reply, you have to do this. So it's all about consensus decision making. It's a little overwhelming when people have opinions and don't know what they're asking you. Uh, but you learn to be patient and to listen. And uh, so it was a great uh, project for interdisciplinary study, um, the study of absolutely everything from poetry to geology. There are collections, there is a greenhouse, and it's all also about extending their campus north. You can see this very purple volume, creating this L-shaped form that um, creates a new uh, landscape and something that will thrive and operate at all times of year. So there you can see um, the building, I hope, in the middle um, as it forms a new landscape. Here a little bit closer, the greenhouse facing due south. Um, and then you can see the um, PV array uh, which is a really important part to generating 80% of the, the building's energy. It's a passive house, and so it's all wood construction, heavily insulated, and uh, working with Opal, who are really um, passive house experts. It's been learned, we've learned a lot, um, and they're that committed to it that they're actually creating a new product for. Uh, insulation made out of wood particles that doesn't exist on the East Coast, only the West Coast, and I think in the South. Uh, in any case, this is um, seeing it in the fall, the beautiful colors on the rugged shoreline, and then the extreme weather conditions that this building has to um, kind of thrive, as I said, in that environment. But the focal point is this old oak tree, so framing this oak tree, great place for gathering, and a lot to, you can see some of the similar ideas of solar control to avoid the heat gain from the south and the vertical articulation for, oops, the vertical articulation for the Western Sun and the faculty offices. Tougher, harder back edge to the north and the east with slots, I think five foot slots cut through so you can actually see all the way through the building. So the oval of the landscape, and then this is the array of um, program that's in this. So nothing's repetitive, everything's different, but um, it really is a sense where um, the community of uh, College of the Atlantic are thriving. It's made a big difference for them because it's the first really purpose-built academic building. They have, we even have a place for whale dissection and all the uh, botanical collection from Acadia. And so here you can see this is the gender neutral bathrooms, best view in the world of Frenchman's Bay. And then just a diagram of the wood construction. This is at the southern end, the stair that you can look all the way through the building. And a diagram just really is showing all the assembly um, of that wood, wood frame construction. There's just a couple of pieces of steel for the um, greenhouse and the front uh, columns. But it's a you know very um, 
robust envelope with triple glazing um, wood windows. So triple glazed wood windows. And these are drawings that we're starting to do a lot more of. We call them x-rays. So they are about how the buildings are built, but they're also about how you experience them. So to be an architect, I think you have to kind of operate in both ways, be highly competent technically. And if you're not, find somebody who is. And trying to understand all the systems, so it's a comfortable place, but also to create memorable space and really something bringing those two things together. So as you go inside the building, the idea of daylight, daylight coming in and strategic ways, views out. And so you draw the inside out no matter what the season is. And the idea of these sort of articulated, more private walk to the faculty offices and little niches for students. And then again, the daylight diagrams that we did as we were working through it. The um, botanical collection and the herbarium. So you have science and art in one building, which is quite extreme. And then this teaching greenhouse, um, which is a lot messier now than when we took the pictures originally. Um, and then just these wonderful vantage points um, throughout for students to gather and study. So it's a building that's for class classes during the day. And then at night, it becomes almost like a library where people come and study. All the classrooms are open, and the door, big sliding uh, doors open, et cetera. So part of um, the main thing, it continued in my collaboration with Opal for a project in downtown Waterville where Colby College is. You can see um, the bottom image is showing this building as it sort of completes the block. Um, and seeing it in when it opened, it's a big snowstorm. So again, this idea of extreme weather, but it's about really uh, weaving together old and new. And the weaving together old and the new with the arts. And you know, the arts is something you can see that I've done a lot of work in over the years and trying to realize how you can bring the arts to the community and how you can um, connect with the community. So all of these, it's gonna be the home to the main international films festival in the summers. It uh, connects to the historic opera house, which is city hall. And they have community galleries and Colby's gallery. So Colby's connection, it's a town gown project where Colby and the community have come together downtown. And what's pretty interesting is as David Green, who's the president, um, said, you know, their fate is intertwined. And Colby used to be downtown and moved up in the 30s on the hill. So this is their connection to students like yourselves who don't want to live on campus. They want to live downtown. So they built a dorm. They built an incubator center. They built uh, an, another art center for, for artists and then this project. And it's at the intersection of Main Street and Castanboy Square. It's the most critical intersection in downtown. So we got to know a lot about their history. And so this weaving together of all this program and the historic opera house, which you can see here in that section slice. So this becomes a building that brings this new facility at this corner, which used to be an old department store. We tried to save it, but it was in such terrible condition and not noteworthy really, but I thought it would be possible, but we recalled it. But if you come into the building, it becomes the threshold to the arts, and then you connect over to um, the historic opera building. We were talking, Rose and I were talking a little bit about history and the importance of respecting sort of and preserving the integrity of older buildings. And I think this actually brings this one to life by um, linking the project to it. So here you come in, you go up, and you connect over. And so it was impossible and inaccessible, et cetera. And I think one of these, so here you can see in section how that, that comes about. Well, I won't dwell on these, but I think what's interesting about this intersection of Main Street and Castanway Square, as you can see, it snows. It is cold up there a lot and it's inland, it's not on the coast. So you, the gray areas in the building basically brings the street inside. And so it's on both levels, both floors, you have this whole sort of L-shaped lobby that's a place to be. You don't have to pay anything. It's cold. You can come walk in and through the building, you can sit down there. And, you know, the galleries for the community, the classroom, the um, art museum from Colby, and then upstairs, the three movie theaters, burgers space. 
And so it's building that um, it's sort of invites you in, but it's also building that enables, frames the views out. So you're looking out onto Costanboy Square, you're looking out to Main Street. And here you can see um, it completed, just opened um, in December. And um, how it really factors into um, a reading of this historic fabric. We worked really hard. We used the local brick that all of this was from. And the rhythm and texture of the glazing sort of recalls some of the pilasters and the brick and the coursing, the horizontal coursing here. But the transparency that draws you into the building, into that program, you really know what's going on. This is at the opening, which our big marquee is so beautiful. Um, recalls Robert Indiana's big heat um, from World's Fair and uh, the graphics and working with Peter Shear of H Plus was really fun and wonderful. But here again, if those elevations at night are as important, that interior elevation. There are 500, more than 500 people at the opening. And here you can see that activity. There's even a chocolate shop from a local chocolate factory in Rockland. And one of the things we're really careful about is thinking about materials and colors and that palette that is drawn from place and extended, but realizing when you don't have a lot of money, color is really important. It really brings joy, but neutrality and color together. Um, and the bridge cross, big graphics to get you to cross that bridge. And then here, the big lower level. Uh, lobby into the Colby Museum of Art Spaces. So up the stairs, uh, lots of incredible shade and shadows, very industrial because of the industrial center that it once was. The rehearsal space, the size of the stage of the opera building. And then as you look back and down into the big double white space and the three movie theaters, each a different color, each, each a different size, and hopefully be memorable. Um, so I have, I guess, a couple more to go, but um, this is the Miami, Great Miami Rowing Center. It's a concept design that we've just finished. It's right on the Great Miami River in Hamilton, Ohio. It's a pretty great site, right at the intersection of downtown. And I think what's interesting is it's a place that has a history of flooding, which was um, dealt with in 1913. So they have a very fortified riverfront. So it's an ideal rowing center. And so trying to think about how this boathouse sitting on the uh, edge of the river, looking back at the historic fabric of downtown, how it can be a place for the community, not just rowing. And so we looked at that sort of opportunity for an efficient base for storage of boats and then the upper space for exercise and community gathering. So I think some of these diagrams, you know, when you're in school, particularly the importance of understanding the program, sort of a, this is a library for rowing, rowing shells. It's, you know, you need to know how exactly big they are because again, they had really limited pumps. So it had to be a really simple modular and then the celebration of that upper level space, trying to understand the turning, turning radius of a rowing shell so we can make sure the sighting um, we could get these boats in, uh, especially the long eights and this layered um, stacking of the two storage and workout. And here you can see bringing the boats in. And I think these graphics are really helpful in explaining how the operations of this could, could work. A little Moy Bridge is inspiration at the top. And then this great center where for erging and then putting those away so this could be a place for the community, you know, so they could generate revenue. And here you can see it to the right, and it's really important location right at the bridge and big graphics uh, creating a new stepped sort of amphitheater to watch the rowing and then its identity from the other side of the river, simple materials, corrugated metal, painted steel and glass. And part of this backdrop is a housing project we're not involved with. And um, that's, I think, the biggest challenge to the project is getting the developer on board with this, opening it up to the community for really celebration along a bike path. And not to go over this, but I think, as I said, every project is about sustainability and a really 
complete idea about sustainability. Um, and I think, you know, whether you're preserving old or whether you're creating new, really thinking about community and place is, is very important. Um, so just a little farther west in Indiana, I've done a lot of work for the university when I was at Bolshek and Indian. And so this was a site on this beautiful historic campus that everything there is limestone and landscape. It's very American campus. It's kind of grand and monumental and sturdy. And um, the two buildings, the one with the curb, and then I did the whole renovation of the um, IMK Museum. And the president said, Susie, this is for your new, new practice. And so this is a Carillon a bell tower for um, its 88,000 pounds of bells. It's a grand Carillon. It's a radial structure inspired by being in this arboretum landscape and trying to create something that seems sympathetic to that condition and open and something that people can engage with. And so all around it, it's actually, there's Wi-Fi access, though it's a public place in the middle of this arboretum and a kit of parts um, and that steel frame, these hubs and around, it's a really a steel frame structure with limestone. Everything has to be limestone. And it's a designing a monumental instrument, not a violin, but in this case, for carillonneurs to play those bells, they have to climb to the top of this, you know, to the bottom part of the playing cabin and then the bells are above. And here is the construction. They had a webcam, so that was really great to wake up every morning and watch what was going on. And these bells, um, four new bells cast and the rest retuned in the four. And we realized Duncan in my office, he found out, he said, all these bells are engraved, but none of them have, are quotes from women. There were 61 bells from their old Carolyn. So they, nobody knew that at the university. So four new bells, and one of them is the biggest one, but Sappho, Hildegard of Bingen, and Emily Dickinson, and Maya Angelou, and they all have their inscriptions, which I thought was really fantastic. The president was excited to do that. Lots of different, you know, considerations of what the structure could be, working with Dan Cecil, wonderful structural engineer, to conceptualize this. So this is working at the light, on the lighting at night, um, and then just thinking about what it's really about structure and supporting the bells, accessing the, um, accessing the cabin for playing. So here you see it um, in the landscape, uh, the exploded axon, all the pieces. And this lines up with what had been the stadium on this site. And the stadium from Breaking Away, for those of you who remember that movie, and if you haven't seen it, go see it. It's an old movie town gown, and this is where the race was. And so the stadium is no longer, they tore it down when I and Pei did the museum, um, but this is at the access as you come in. So just a couple more. Um, one thing I've never done before really was residential work. So it's been kind of interesting, it's different. I think I could make residential buildings sort of institutional. I think this is a nature center. But anyway, this is, um, a, in the Hudson Highlands, and it happens the road's called Erie, which is a nest of a bird of prey. So it seemed right to um, decide to make it something like that, a nest. Has tremendous views. West Point is to the right and the Bear Mountain Bridge. And it's also a kind of incredible storied landscape, you know, from the Hudson River School and the paintings, et cetera. So capturing these views, honoring it and framing it, um, really became the opportunity and object of this exercise. So it's an upside down house where living is above and it's sort of a motel pillow with bedrooms and really trying to be inspired by being in this beautiful place and thinking about um, exactly um, how it sits and frames the landscape. While I think in some ways it's an object, it also is more, more so a frame. And here you can see the construction, steel and wood um, construction, highly insulated um, envelope, triple glazed windows, geothermal system, PV array, uh, and natural materials, stone, zinc, glass, and wood. 
And again, another one of those X-ray drawings, the experience in the context of the making of the material pattern. Um, so you really feel like you're in this wood box floating over the landscape. Um, and here you can see as you come in the view under the cantilever toward the river and sort of the glow of the light is magnificent um, and just slices through, kind of like in College of the Atlantic, these st strategic slices through the building um, too. And so when you come up to the top floor, um, this big deck along the back, you can see that overlooks the view. And then this super cool stair that cantilevers off the wall um, as you come up and down throughout the double white space. So there's just some sort of captures the essence of being in this place and the quality of light and materials and how they play off of each other. And this is an ode to the house that was on the site that was in really rough shape. And it was built in the 70s and out of bad materials, but it had a sunken living room and it seemed important to honor that um, 70s vibe. So here you can see the views and the texture and quality of the wood and cedar and zinc and the stone that emerges as the base or out of the landscape that really is about the quality of this rocky terrain. And here, just the view, you see really floating in the trees. And then this is a project that's right, um, not too far north, uh, but in Northwest Connecticut. And, you know, I actually act doing these couple of houses. I'm not sure how many more I'm going to do. They're a lot of work. They're, it's a totally different thing. Um, people make decisions differently, but it's, it's interesting. So um, this is a, on this lake, um, uh, and it's simple site. It's um, slopes, beautiful views of a small lake. And, um, but what's interesting about it, it's road is 79 old CNE, which used to be the railroad tracks for um, bringing people to the summer colonies of back in the early, you know, late 19th century, et cetera. So um, the road is sort of a dead end. It used to go through, but this is the culture of, of this place. So it's a steep slope, looks out to the lake. Um, and where do you put the house on it? Um, so the idea of getting the program and weaving the program into this, but trying again to break its scale down, to integrate it into the topography so it didn't seem as monumental, which is really nice to have a client who wants to, while doing something extraordinary, wants to be modest in some way and wants it to be all about the landscape. So as we start to think about this um, building, how can it be about the view? How can it be more porous? And how can you think and navigate the incredible uh, tree canopy, and mature trees, a wide variety of them there? And think about um, seeing through these components and making the program express the components of um, the design and the massing. And so just some sketches, but here you can see the strategy of the sort of a main singular building and then a whole terraced rootscape. And because it's sloped, you actually see those roofs. So the idea of a green roof um, for a majority of it, and then you can see the main public space you can see through and um, bring clear story light from the south faces east and ventilation through. Um, so here you can see inspired by many green roofs, but this is a beautiful place in um, well, Manitoba where Russell Wright's home and garrison, which you can go visit, it's public, open to the public. Um, but that is just a beautiful thing. And to be living in a space that makes you feel like you're in the landscape, um, I think hopefully will be really effective each of the series of bedrooms as they marched down the topography. Um, I won't go into the planning much, but I think you can see it's pretty rational, and ordered, yet um, simple. And then the greenhouse. And I, I think this is, um, I don't know if you guys use Enscape. It's a, a little scary because it can be a little slick, right? But what's interesting about it is, so here's Enscape, a white building. And then you see, how the color and material decisions are so important. You know, you can really destroy a design if you don't get that right. 
you know, so we're working on it now, but this idea of this sort of rougher, darker outer envelope with lighter wood in the inside. Um, here you can see it further north. But I, I do think it's interesting to try that out. Don't just decide, see what works because I think it helps a lot. Again, a really serious sustainable proposition with from wells to systems to materials. So I'll end finally, and then you guys can have your uh, food, but uh, is like a project of light. It's the urban and the rural. It is this, right? Where I showed you this before. And where is it but central? So if you think about it, um, city is about that. And the vision to create Temple Park, it was a big nightmare politically to decide where that was going to go. And people wanted here, everywhere in the city. And so it's still called Central Park, not named after anybody. It's a public space. And you know, this is a fabulous view of, of that. The sites in the northern part of the park where there was an existing facility for skating and swimming. And but I think the purpose of this park and the, our clients at the Central Park Conservancy, it's about healthful recreation for all. Um, it's horrible to see the word classes. That's not a word that we use today, but it's about a place for everybody and a place to enjoy for people who couldn't get out of the city. You know, not everybody can get out of the city. And so making, you realize during COVID how important it was to have a place to go. And so we looked and did a lot of research and worked with the Conservancy and knows so much. They're the landscape architects, so they're our client and our collaborator to see about how this site emerged and what its history was. But in the 60s, they let this happen. And it's this very aggressive um, fortress that really blocked the rest of the park off from the Harlow community. So first thing we, I just said, we have to get rid of it. And so it was a real barrier, inaccessible, open only a part time of the year. So now the idea of having that be replaced. And you can see it really was a barrier to the historic archway in terrible condition. It leaked almost a million uh, gallons of water a day, cool, potable water, New York City drinking water. I mean, really bad. So here, how could we make that happen? And we started to find out that the stream originally came through and into the mirror. And so, you know, making these models and drilling, so you get rid of that, you have this huge space. And even sort of DNA of the Da Vinci Code, the Olmsted and Fox, these are pure circle. I was amazed. And so here, the history of that evolution, the original stream that fed the Harlem Mirror was in a culvert under the building. And so you can see some of the original photographs from the New York Public, Public Library and on into um, where it was when we inherited the project. So this idea of taking the building, slipping the building to, to the east and integrating that along the drive of that. And this is the condition of this building that blocked everything. But there were some examples in the park um, of buildings that were integrated into the topography. And so what if we did that? And if we pulled the building away and we created a big outdoor room, and then brought the stream through and framed between the two um, drives. So what was becoming this today with the stream coming through, a, still a monumental pool, but the building enveloped in the landscape, more park. So from above, you won't even know that there's a building there, but you'll see this changing uh, landscape outdoor room that is three buildings in one. So here, um, the site plan, the sort of movement and making it all accessible um, so that everybody can go there. And then here it is, this was a couple months ago, uh, but it's been under construction for a while. We still have about a year and a half to go. Um, but it's again, very sustainable. It has um, little to no air conditioning, just in some of the staff spaces in the building. Um, but a big overhang and um, to complete immersed in the green roof. I think the hardest part about the sustainability is that it is a pool and it is a rink and they require tremendous mechanical systems. 
But this again, the x-ray that shows how this building sits in the landscape with the big stone wall and the skylight to bring drop light down in the back. These are um, huge pivot doors that are um, five feet. That's how tall it is, five feet by 13 feet. And they'll pivot open to create a porch in the summer and then close in the winter time. So here you can see from the inside, public, public place open to the public, free for everybody. And then these sections I think are effective because you can start to see how that integrates the outdoor room framed, controlled because of being a, a, a New York City park. So it's both public park and um, sort of more conservancy driven the rest of the year. And then three buildings in one. So it's the pool, it's gonna become a green, which is new. It's a big open green space in the interim season, and then it will become the rink and then go back to being a green. So that's really keeping it open probably 10 months a year versus six months a year. The material element and the mock-ups on the site, and then just some final photographs from the other day. And this is pretty cool because that's sort of same view. And then one last shot here. This is what it used to be. You look at this big wall of, and the truck dock and mechanical equipment, and that's what it's starting to become. And so um, I'll leave you just with a quote that I left you with last time, we began with last time, as the wild places are where we began. When they end, so do we. We had better not speed their passing. Our talents can keep them if we let them. Thank you. Susie, thank you so much. What an elegant lecture in every respect. Oh, thank you. With like your words, and especially the wonderful, wonderful x-ray. Oh, it's just it's, it's the magic. Well, my team's incredible. Um, oh, and I, sorry, I forgot to mention one thing. Mitchell Jerkola is our partner um, for the Central Park Project, and John Doherty is, is my partner in this effort. So they have been wonderful to work with. I know the food's waiting, so two questions. Who's got a question? Come on, come on, come on. Harvey. Thank you. Then the difference between working on large firms, how do you make that difference? You can ask Charlie. Uh, how did I make the transition? You know, I think that's the best thing I ever did. Um, but I think I couldn't have done it if I hadn't had that great experience for 32 years. I mean, I had an amaz amazing partners. There's my friends still. I mean, I also, when I left, I still had to finish things too. So, but how did you do it? I don't know. I think you just get to know what you need to do. And you did, and as somebody said, you know, when you're on your own, you can make any stupid decision you want and nobody's going to give you a hard time about it. So... <laughs> But um, you're, I, being more serious, I think um, it's not easy. You know, I, right now, I think I could use a really great management partner if anybody's interested. Um, you know, I, I think that when you're, you're well poised as design architects, but when we become the architects of record, which we're doing a lot of work with Elise now, who was my former client, and we're doing a number of projects as the architects of record, as well as the design architects. I think that's harder, you know, and I think when um, I, I'm the design architect working with an executive architect, it's a wonderful partnership. I know how to do that because I did it for 32 years and I had great partners in that effort. So, so I'm still learning, <laughs> but at least, you know, you know where to call for liability insurance and they take your call. <laughs> so. Of uh, natural light coming into buildings, you mentioned the idea of the light, but then you also had mentioned like the idea of like color being shorted, which to those like 
who live in like um, where they have like low income areas of your but they consider like adding color to like some of those like natural lighting that you add in the in your building, like how you like I don't know like the skylights. No. <laughs> no, I, I I think the beauty of natural light is once you do that, I think that it's no longer the feeling of being outside. So I think there's for me, it's I love the purity of the natural light and it's the, it actually makes things completely different colors all on its own, which I think is kind of extraordinary. And you know, one thing if you're interested in that is there um different plants and that uh, like colorful plants that if light shined on them, if the concrete has mica in it, it actually becomes pink. Um, what's uh, Ur Urban Gill? If you look him up, he was an architect in um, the San Diego area, West Coast. Um, and he did that work, I don't know, in the 20s. But it was kind of amazing to experiment with what natural light and color and then how it can translate or you know it's the same with reflectivity too so mm -hmm. well thank you so much Susan. everybody <laughs> <laughs>